All right. Thank you everyone for joining us here tonight for another one of our night talks. Um, I know we're kind of getting used to these now. They're really fun to do with Emily. Uh, a lot of people from all over the country have started watching these, so I really appreciate y'all joining in tonight. Tonight we have two Texas representatives with us and Emily will introduce each of them. If you have a question during the conversation, please be sure to use the Q&A window down at the bottom. And then you can also use the chat window as well to talk with any of us or to talk with each other. Uh, please keep it uh, safe and sane, and we will make sure to address as many of your questions as we possibly can. Emily? Great. Uh, good evening, everyone. And um, as Anna said, I'm super excited. We have um, two of our representatives who, as you can imagine, are incredibly busy right now in their own districts. Um, Tian Parker, uh, District 63, which is up my way in North Texas. Um, I will say for all of you that are selling products outside of regular food, you can thank him um, because he actually partnered with me to get the retail waiver put in place um, that allows our restaurants to actually sell abroad um, set of goods, which I think is helping from a revenue standpoint. It's also helping our consumers in some of our harder hit areas to actually have access and resources to things they need. Um, so welcome. And um, second, we have um, Eddie Rodriguez, who is from District 51 down on the Austin area. Um, we had not had a chance to meet before either, before the crisis began. And he was one of the first to reach out and actually have really thoughtful questions about how we got the restaurants in his area through this crisis. Um, and so we had a chance to have a number of conversations and he's been just such a champion for the sector as well. So thank you both for being here tonight. Um, I get to kick it off, I guess, because I get to uh, uh, be in the driver's seat to start. But you know, I just want to maybe just set the stage for everyone who's listening. Um, if we just try to go back to January 1st, and 2020 was going to be this amazing year, and as you looked across Texas, we had about 50,000 eating and drinking establishments. We employed close to 1.4 million people. I think it was second in the state. And last year, we contributed 70 billion in sales. So we were just sort of this monster and this engine in the state. And frankly, we were really thriving. Whether you were chain or independent, life was really good. Fast forward to today. We currently have two fifths of our operators have closed one or more of the restaurants. The industry, as of the end of April, is projecting to lose 700,000 jobs in Texas alone. Sales are projected to decline by 70%. We have some, of course, restaurants that have completely closed down, but those that are operating may be running, running at 20 to 30% of the revenue they used to. And more than one third of restaurants are actually gonna to continue to lay off more people if the closed dining room goes past April 30th. So the numbers are staggering, but what I always try to balance is the numbers with, I know what you hear a lot, which is stories from the people who live within your districts. So um, I'm gonna read a couple to you just to, to make sure we start where we are today. I've been in business since 1975. We built and opened a multi-unit venue just 18 months ago. It is actually the livelihoods of all their employees and their families are, uh, are, are relying on our existence. We need help and we need help ha now or none of us will make it through this. We, felt, we feel left out and we feel that we have no hope. We've been working for 10 years as an entrepreneur to build a business what are you going to do to help Texans like me? This is my industry. It's my life. And I'm about to lose everything. So as we start just here, for our restaurant owners, our operators, and our employees, you know, here we are. What comments do you have? And maybe I'll start with you, um, um, Representative Rodriguez, and kind of if you hear this and you see the data and you feel the pain that we feel every single day, maybe just some opening comments, because I know you've been deeply engaged in this in your own area. Yeah, I have. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me here and thank you for all your help you know early on i think immediately when when we started kind of shutting things down here in austin uh, prior to even the governor's order the city was uh, doing a shelter or some some form of shelter in, uh, in place uh one of some of the first calls i got were from uh workers that worked at restaurants and bars and and small local restaurants and bars it's a big part of my district a big part of as many of you know austin and so Really, what I try to what I try to tell them, I try to get them through kind of the minutia that, that is sometimes state government, local government. And so I was trying to be a conduit to, for them to give them some answers on how they can maybe find some resources to keep them going. And then then I just basically try to to talk to folks like you um, and and others, but also use my network of of uh, you know social media and then the network of people that I know about making sure that people understand that these restaurants are still, can still serve food. They're gonna try, maybe try to do curbside or anything like that and really pushing that on social media and making sure that people understand that these are our neighbors and our friends. And that um, one of the things that we can do now, granted, not everyone is in a situation 
uh, like perhaps many of us are, where we can't afford to go out to to eat or to go, you know, pick, go, go get some uh, food for uh, delivery or pickup uh, once a week or twice a week. And in my case, I try to, you know, maybe three or four times a week if I can. Um, but to the extent that you can, that's one of the things that I try to do just to encourage um, everyone in my social network that this is important. And if you can do it, support these local businesses. The bar scene is a little bit different, obviously, than the restaurant scene. They're, they're full on, pretty much shut down. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's been, for, for me and for here in Austin, people have responded very well because people love their local restaurants and they're, they're going. And I know that the businesses are still suffering greatly and they've let go of a majority of a lot of their staff. And some of them is pretty much shut down, as you may have heard. Threadgill's one of the mainstays here in Austin is now no more, which is uh, hard to even think of. Um, and so anyway, that's, that's the kind of hope I try to give and just try to be a resource for, for them. Excellent, great. Great. Tan? Well, first of all, Emily, thank you for your leadership. Uh, you've been extraordinary, and I'm so proud of you and your team and all you're doing every day to help all of our restaurants across the state. You know, look, I'm a small business owner myself, Emily, and, I, and so I understand the pain uh, that all these small businesses are going through. Uh, my family for over 40 years was in the restaurant business. It provided the livelihood for my family. And so I understand deeply the challenges these restaurants are facing. Uh, from the time I, my young, earliest memories in life, really as a teenager, were working in the restaurants, right? And uh, working in the kitchens and bussing tables and waiting and serving. And so restaurants have always been a critical part of our communities. Uh, you know, they give so much. I mean, even today in this horribly challenging time, the restaurants in my district are giving back and helping people without food. They're, they're, they're providing resources to all these food banks in the area and the region, and they do it so selflessly. It's extraordinary when they're hurting so badly themselves. So they really, in so many ways, represent a microcosm of our society. They, they really represent our community. I mean, our, our greatest memories in life are happening at our local restaurants, right? Be it a birthday or celebration of a big achievement in life, getting together with friends and family all the time. All those things are all circulating around restaurants. So restaurants have always been there for us as a society. It's now our time to step up and support them. And so I really want folks to look at this whole dynamic in that it is a uh, an integrated ecosystem, right? That, that they've always been there for us. We need to be there for them in these difficult times. Uh, just like Eddie said a moment ago, I try to be a conduit to what my restaurants are telling me, what they're saying, what, they're, what I'm hearing, so then I can communicate effectively with our state agencies, obviously with the governor and his office, all of our elected officials, so we can make certain that we are taking care of everybody as best we possibly can. And that really is the story about how we've been working together in the last month, Emily, is that yeah. one of my own constituents here, a restaurateur by the name of David Henry from uh, Denton County, brought me this concept about retail food sales. And uh, it was a great concept. And so I kind of working with you and the governor's office and our agencies, uh, it's a prime example of how Eddie and myself and our other colleagues can be uh, supportive is to listen to the need. And then we mm -hmm. saw the fact that, my goodness, we had this incredible restaurant supply chain that was, was backed up. You had all this food that was on the verge of spoilage. You had an opportunity to be able to help all of these restaurants with, you know, trying to have a little bit more margin, a little bit more money at the end of the day to take care of more employees. And, and so, you know, it's these kinds of things that we just are in this together. That's our message collectively is we've got to work together to continue to find solutions. Uh, our doors are open to, to hear from everybody every day around the clock on whatever we can do to help alleviate the pain in some degree that's currently taking place. And of course, we, we can't wait to, to the day that we can open up. Uh, hopefully it's very, very soon. And we can do so in a way that's safe and responsible, that we protect our economy and all these businesses that we know are hurting so badly. And we understand that so deeply as small business people, but at the same time, do it in a sensible and smart way that protects everybody. So we can have a sustainable recovery for the restaurants and for the entire economy. Yeah, thank you. Very well said. And I, and I think that's correct. I think it's the idea that we need to be smart. We've seen other states leap forward and some comes, come cases, maybe a couple of days notice. Um, they're throwing the doors open on these businesses. And not only are our restaurants not ready, but I think it's going to be a false alarm in some cases, and it actually could set them back. Um, because we need that's to be thoughtful. That's the last thing we want to do is set them back, right? It's got to be, we got to do it intelligently so we do not set them back. 
That's exactly right. And, and you can see as an association, we've been deeply engaged in the federal issues of making sure we had additional PPP money that now we're working very hard on the guidelines. Um, you know, our congressional delegation has been great partners to the sector. And but you see us now pivoting right to the state, which is, um, you know, I guess the number one question people are going to want to know is, do you have any insight of when we'll be able to open? And so I know the governor had a conference call today, so um, I'm not sure. I know the announcement is allegedly Monday, and I think he's being very thoughtful and taking as much insight as he can. Um, but have you heard any rumblings about when that might be? Oh, Eddie, if you want to go first. Um, I, not, not, not specifically, nothing that I can actually share. I think, uh, I think that the governor is listening to uh, our medical, uh, our health care experts, and I think if it, when that does happen, if it, if it happens very soon, it will be with the guidance of um, with our health care experts out there. I think it has to. And I certainly hope that there's going to be, it'll be enough runway so that the restaurants can better prepare on how they're going to yeah. gradually reopen and how that's going to look. And maybe some kind of standard, I'm hope, hopeful that there's some kind of standard that would be uh, beneficial to uh, some of the larger, maybe chain restaurants that do have the drive-through capacity. And then of course, those that, that never had a drive-through at all, that this, the smaller mom and pops right. that only have the dine, the dine in and how they can succeed uh, once we do open and, and prepare to rehire at whatever pace they might need to rehire. But, I'm, but yeah. it needs to be done thoughtfully for sure. Yeah, and I'll kind of take that from the, the rehiring part, right? So you're seeing restaurants now with some of the enhanced unemployment benefits that are available through the COVID crisis. Um, we're starting to catch wind of not just our sector, but many sectors where um, we're finding it very difficult to bring employees back. Um, so if employees are currently getting the additional stipend or um, additional 600 per week, uh, we clearly want to take care of our employees at the same time. We've now got requirements from a loan perspective that are on our back. At the same time, we want to get them back to work. And so I, you know, this is something that's coming up a lot. And so maybe Tian kicking over to you, you know, how do you, what do you do to a restaurant? And they say, I can't get my employees to return to work. We were already estimated to be close to 200,000 jobs short before the crisis. Um, now we've seen mass layoffs and furloughs. And so if you're a restaurant, maybe it's in um, Denton County and you want to reopen, but you can't find employees um, because there may be an incentive for them not to return. Yeah. Well, look, this is another major challenge as you've identified that all these restaurants are now facing. Uh, and, and again, we got to take a spirit of cooperation, collaboration, working together to solve the problem. You know, the fact that there's an additional $600 per week now that's uh, offered for folks that are receiving unemployment benefits until July 25th, I know is a challenge that many of these restaurants uh, are concerned with. Um, you know, I've been assured talking to the Texas Workforce Commission uh, that they will work with these employers. For example, uh, if a restaurant here in Denton County or a restaurant in Eddy's district uh, offers a job that was effectively comparable to the job that the individual had previously, uh, meaning similar, similar number of hours, similar type of work, if you will, within the restaurant, uh, and they walk away from that offer uh, because they're getting additional monies today, uh, that $600, uh, the Texas Workforce Commission will intervene. Uh, we don't want anyone to lose their benefits, but they will, they will take in and potentially stop folks from getting benefits uh, if they're walking away from an opportunity to have a sustainable, long-time, permanent job. Right, because at the end of the day, you know, we realize that a little bit of extra money for a couple of months is not a is not a not a job that provides for a family and for many years right. into the future that we're able to grow our economy, help all the restaurants, and help Texas as a whole grow. So I think that'll be the, the, the kind of the fine line that we walk. Uh, the Texas Work Workforce Commission will really be involved in the management and the enforcement of that type of program so that we make certain that people are going back to work appropriately. We're also gonna to have to do a lot of retooling and retraining with regard to the workforce, I think broadly, for restaurants potentially, as well as for all kinds of other industries. And the state of Texas, of course, will step up and, and play a role in that process also. Um, but coming back to the earlier question a moment ago too that uh, was asked, you know, again, the governor is being very thoughtful about where we are right now. All of us wanna open up today, <laughs> obviously, emotionally. We want to open up today. We want to open up weeks ago. We want to never close, of course. But at the end of the day, the governor is looking very thoughtfully at the data. He's got an incredible team of scientists that are, that are guiding him, some of the very finest in the country, with regard to what we're looking at, where we are in the curve of cases uh, as they're starting to come down, 
looking at the amount of tests that we have available in terms of inventory, looking at the PPE inventory. All these are factors. I want everybody to know, all the restaurateurs, that the governor and his team, this incredible strike force that's comprised of some of the great entrepreneurs in Texas, Tillman Fertitta and others uh, in the restaurant business, will be giving great guidance to the governor as we move forward. But just as I said a moment ago, we look forward to the governor's guidance and commentary on Monday uh, about how we're going to reopen Texas and get our restaurants uh, back to work. And I know yeah, that I the think... Texas, uh, real quick, I'm sorry, but I know that the Texas Workforce Commission does have a shared work program, and I think that's something that maybe some of the employees, uh, employers, excuse me, uh, might want to look into as well. Yeah, you know, thank you so much, because I think that's one of the messages we want to get out is that, you know, two things. One is that if you're thinking about rehiring, and if you had a server, and you're going to have 70, 80% less business for a couple of weeks, their ability to earn tips is going to be really limited. Um, and it's almost unfair to bring them back at the tip rate, right, without their ability to earn that income. So two things for those that did take out, many of them a PP or P loan, they can actually average the tips prior, right? And so they can actually put that in as a supplement would be one. But second, I think what Eddie raises is really important is that you can actually remain on unemployment for a percentage of your hours and back at your restaurant for a percentage of hours. It's called the shared work plan. And if you go to the Tech for Texas Workforce Commission site, um, I have to say that we've had so many agencies support us through this. I cannot say enough about the Texas Workforce Commission for both our employees and our employers. The, the load that they are carrying is extraordinary. And, and I, they have just been exceptional. We have many employees call us. We obviously work more with the employers, but we get them right over to Texas Workforce Commission. But something to think about if you're trying to bring people back, starting to plan, that is actually something that would be very, very important um, is that shared work plan that Eddie mentioned. So thank you. I think the Workforce Commission, they did get up to a rocky start, but that's just because seeing an 800% increase, uh, whatever that number ended up being, there's no way to prepare for that. But I think they've really uh, done a good job um, the last few I agree. Weeks. And we need to, we really commend them. And so one of the, you know, I'll mention this, and I think Tan's had a look at it as well, but um, to your point, we feel really strongly that as an association, we should help drive some of the, the um, recovery efforts, right? So we assembled a team about 10 days ago now of the very largest chains in our state from Papa's to Brinker and Darden and down to our independents who are so critical. And we had them develop the Texas Restaurant Promise, which we've now um, presented to the Strike Force Lieutenant Governor and of course to the Governor's um, our Task Force and Strike Force. And so everything's been pushed out. We've been putting it around the state as sort of what we call shared guidance. And um, Eddie, I think you may have had a question yourself around the big versus small, right? We know that there's many restaurants that didn't even have carry out delivery um, let alone a drive through. And so they've been shuttered, right? So they're just sitting almost idle and waiting. And so one of the things we, you know, one of the questions we've been asked a lot about, will the state come in? Is there any type of recovery fund or is there any thinking around providing a, a resource to help these restaurants that have, you know, we know business interruption is a huge topic, which we're not going to get into right now. Um, but th they don't really have the resources to even restart these small mom and pops. And so can you imagine a discussion where the state could come in particular for restaurants that lost everything when they closed, right? Food, you name it, it's all spoiled and they're gonna have to almost rebuy everything, including cleaning supplies, if there's any required PPE equipment. I mean, that's gonna really start to drag down a restaurant's ability to function when they already have such small margins. So I just love some thoughts about, you know, we see some other states considering this. Is this something you can imagine us going to? And I know we have a deficit right now, especially looking at West Texas and our oil issue. Um, but I just think that that would be a way that the state could step in to try to help. So I know which one of you wants to maybe take that first, Eddie? Oh, sure. Why not? Um, we'll go back yeah, and forth. <laughs> <laughs> <We'll take it. laughs> uh, I think um, you're right. We're going to be working at it with the deficit uh, session. I can't imagine us not at this point. Um, a fund, I think, would be a fine idea. Um, I don't, you know, where that, how you, how you fund that fund is, is another question for, for probably another time. But I think it is a, a pretty good idea. I think, I think whenever you have crises like this and disasters like this, we as a state and let's just any government at every level, we need to learn from something from these disasters, from these crisis situations. So I hope that we can look at this and be better prepared in the future. Hopefully we, something like this never happens again. But in the event that even if it doesn't, we know that this is, a pretty high watermark and how can we better prepare for this in the future um, that could be as simple as you know better technology for workforce commission and for um, you know other type other agencies and whatnot 
uh, it, it could mean, okay, uh, setting up a fund where, you know, maybe there is an, a little added, uh, you know, something to a, to uh, your restaurant bill that would go strictly to this fund or, or we find another way to do it. Um, and then also take into consideration the kind of jobs that will be lost. And a lot of these hourly jobs that, that rely on tips, I mean, those are, you know, those are really hard to come back to, especially if it's going to take, you have some ramp up time that you're going to need. But I just, I'd like to, take, to look at this as a learning opportunity as a legislator, as a lawmaker, and what we can do to better prepare for it. It's going to be tough to create a fund, but I think looking at some kind of mechanism uh, that could lead to that, I think is really important so we can address this because we can't just print money. And the federal no. government can't print money every time something like this happens. We have to have some kind of protocols and systems in place. Uh, I'm not saying exactly what all that is right now. I'm just saying that it's sure. something that we that certainly I as a lawmaker need to look at how we can prepare for something like this in the future. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things we thought about too was um, there's a lot of funding coming down to help in the healthcare and hospital arena. And in some cases, you know, there's very large sums of money coming to the state. And so as you think about the restaurant's role and having to, you know, we've always been really guarded by the health departments, right? They govern what we do, the health departments across the state. So we are one of the most regulated businesses when it comes to keeping people safe as they're eating, if not the most. So this is what we do. I try to tell people that want to put really harsh guidelines that we're, we're not a group of accountants, no disrespect, right? That's trying to open a restaurant next week. Um, this is really what we do for a living. And so, but we're going to have a lot of additional cleaning and a lot of additional things that we're going to have to do, whether it's restaurants, but if I include my friends in hotels, um, think about amusement parks and a lot of the big revenue generating areas of the state. Is there an opportunity to maybe look at some of that that may go to health and human services as an idea that we thought about that we could put a, almost a, um, a continuation program together, right? So, so we have this cleaning and, and all the rules we've written down that people will follow, but then how do you sustain that long term? Is there an opportunity maybe to have us ha create something with the Health and Human Services Department or State Department of Health and create something that would be in the restaurants um, as a way to help fund all the things that they're going to have to pay for initially is it maybe a recovery fund, but long term, I think we've got to solidify these practices because I think the worst thing we can do is have a bounce back, right? Yeah. And if we sit in the fall and have the same situation. So yeah, Tana, no, if you I, want to take that one. No, no, look, I, I agree with everything. I, Eddie's comments were spot on. We want to learn from these experiences. We want to do everything in our power to try to address the pain and the suffering and to be able to help uh, these businesses get back on their feet. I mean, again, I can't stress to you enough and everybody listening tonight is that we really understand how painful it is uh, and, and that it's horribly difficult and challenging right now. You know, look, I, I think in terms of a fund, uh, you know, I think generally speaking, the public at large would be open to voluntarily uh, looking at giving an extra dollar or something at kind of a like a tip uh, that goes to a fund, perhaps that goes to help all the restaurants in the state of Texas. I mean, something along those lines that is respectful to the taxpayer and allows people to voluntarily help the restaurants, uh, I think might make some real sense. Uh, but in terms of partnering with the Texas Workforce Commission, that's a tremendous resource like we talked about earlier with regard to these employment issues. Uh, all of these various agencies of government will be extraordinarily responsive to our restaurant owners. And so, you know, we're too early into it at this point to have a crystal ball about what definitively we can do or not do. Uh, you know, I'll just tell you, I think I speak, you know, broadly for most of my colleagues that we will openly look at everything. Um, you know, there's nothing that we're not going to look at to try to help everyone in the restaurant industry, to help any industry as we recover from this incredible experience that uh, is so tragic and difficulty, difficult that none of us have ever experienced in our lifetime, right? You think about, you know, there's never been anything like this since the Spanish flu in 1918, with a handful of people that are alive today that were, you know, young children, uh, you know, and there's a very few of them that are living with us today. But as a result of that, we just have got to really be open to anything that can help keep our businesses up and running across sectors, but particularly the restaurants, and I think that the restaurant owners will see that we'll do everything to be responsive to that. You know, I've had some conversations the last, uh, well, the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about 4A and 4B money. Uh, yes. In fact, I just had a conversation with uh, our wonderful director of economic development for the governor. Uh, and we heard a discussion about utilizing, cutting through some of the red tape. So much about what we can do as lawmakers right now in this crisis is to cut through the red tape to make it easier for restaurants to do business. That's really the story about what we talked about earlier with allowing retail bulk food items to be sold through carry out or the drive. Alcohol, got to keep alcohol. alcohol. Alcohol to go for the mixed drinks. I mean, 
These are all things that, you know, in my opinion, are very important that we continue to do long term until we get through this entire cycle. Uh, and then I think permanently, I think there, a lot of these things we recognize, you know, we're living, we lived the way they were that used to be with this regulatory burden that we now can give these restaurants an opportunity to function well without that regulatory burden going forward on some of these creative concepts. And I think with regard to 4A and 4B in particular, and working with these economic development corporations, that there are potentially can be some things that we do in a broader scale where truly local economic development corporations can be able to help their local businesses. And yes. so again, from a state perspective, we're gonna do everything in our power to create flexibility and to allow those entities to take care of their own. Because at the end of the day, they know best, you know, what's taking place. You know, my local folks know what's happening best here in Denton County, just like Eddie's local folks in Austin know what's best and what's happening for the restaurants right there locally in Austin as well. So again, I think I want everybody to understand we're going to be very creative. We want to hear everyone's ideas and concepts so that we can incorporate them into what we're doing. I love it. And that, and that really that what you just mentioned, right? So you think about just your two areas. One of the greatest concerns we have and one of the big asks for, for the governor is consistency across reopening. So, you know, whether he chooses a phased approach, because we do have, I think we have 251 now counties, so almost everyone has had some impact from this, but they're not all equal. And so as he decides maybe that one county will be open further, one of the things that's really important to us is how do you address the inconsistencies that we've seen through the dining room closures or shelter in place? And so one county will do something, the city next door will do something totally different. Then right above them, there's another entirely different set of rules. And so what we're finding is our restaurant owners, let's just imagine that you own Chick-fil-A across all the Chick-fil-A's in the state of Texas, and it's 258, Anna, or something. So how do you manage that? How do you keep people safe if the rules are not consistent? across. And so I'd love your thoughts about, we have a lot, a lot of people asking us questions, you know, who's really in charge? So as the governor says, these are the rules and the guidelines, you know, do you see those changing by city or county? And then how, how, did, how do you ask a, a restaurant really to manage through that, right? When they may have, you know, uh, restaurants that cross 70, 150, or even 200 counties. Yeah. I, if, I, if I may, I guess, yeah. I, I really think that and this, this consistency across the state is critically important. I think not only for the restaurant industry, but I think for a lot of different businesses as well. So I would, in, I would uh, hope that it's not going to be a city by city, county by county kind of thing, that it, it needs to be kind of a statewide thing. That's broad enough, at least the, with the guidelines that are broad enough that the, that the locals can right. work within those guidelines, but it's, but it's consistent enough so that um, the Chick-fil-A owner, as you were saying, that has... Uh, has a Chick-fil-A in Denton and has, and then someone else that has one or he, he or she has one also in Austin that they're virtually the same rules apply and they don't have to reinvent the wheel um, for the other store, right? Good. So I think consistency at the state level is really important. Um, and I, I would hope that the, that, that the governor would go that route for sure. Yay, excellent. Um, well, I think one of the, we have a lot of liability questions. So imagine now you're going to reopen and customers start coming in. And you know, we know that the governor is very committed to tracking and tracing, and we know that testing is gonna be a massive part of that, right? So, and we don't have all the tests that we, we need today, and that's no fault of anyone's, it's just the need. And so if you're a restaurant, what liability protection are we gonna have in place where they can come back and say, I got COVID-19 by being in your restaurant? And I would assume this is a restaurant, it's a gas station, it's a dry cleaner, right? But for us, you know, this is coming up quite a bit, which is, have we thought through liability protection or how does a restaurant know someone's not gonna come back and sue them um, because they claim they got sick on or sitting in that dining room? I, well, I, think, it's a critically, on that one. <laughs> I think it's a critically important issue, Emily. I mean, that, that we focus on that. I mean, I know that's one of the big issues when I talk to my restaurateurs here in, in my district, they're very concerned about this issue. Uh, the president himself, uh, just in the last couple of days has been talking about passing comprehensive um, you know, liability reform to address this very issue across the country. So I, I think he's absolutely on the right uh, direction, the right path to be able to do something meaningfully there at the federal level. But certainly here in Texas, we have a tradition of addressing, um, you know, overly excessive litigation. Tort reform has been a big part of Texas's, if you will, formula for economic success uh, in, in recent decades, and it will continue to be. So so we're all very mindful. I know the governor, all the members of the legislature are very mindful of these kinds of issues that 
uh, folks, you know, are following and in, in the guideline established by CDC, following the guidelines established by our Texas Department of State Health Services, by the guidelines that we get from the, from the governor, ultimately, uh, from the guidelines that the strike force comes out with. And, and of course, all of that you're going to be working with as the TRA in conjunction with. And so if businesses are in compliance with the standard that's being established by all these entities from the federal level to the state level, to the local level, and working with you as the, as the operator, so to speak, the backbone of all the restaurants at TRA for the state, then, then I think they need to have that level of certainty and protection. Yes. But that's one thing they don't need to worry about, right? They're worried enough about trying to squeak out a livable margin to provide a living for all of these employees. Uh, they're worried about being able to make that payroll and, and to pay the utility bill and to make certain that they're paying the rent for the month. I mean, they don't need to worry about the liability piece. That's why we need to address it as long as they're complying with the standards that will come forward here very, very soon. I mean, I Good. think, um, and I'll just add that I think, I think Tan's correct on the standards, whatever those standards are going to be. Now we have to remember the federal, the CDC can have a standard, standard that's here and the Texas standard can be higher or more uh, mm -hmm. strenuous or rig rigorous or whatever, uh, just not less so. So we, we, we don't have to just look at what the CDC does. And I know Tan, you were referring to that as well. We could come up with our more uh, stringent standards. And obviously as long as those standards are very clear and there are across the board, uh, when it comes to the restaurant industry, um, and they're they're equal across the, the line there, then obviously as long as those are being followed, and then they shouldn't be a problem. But they have to be very clear standards, I think, across okay. the board standards. And if they're not being followed, then obviously you you have potentially some legal issues, right? So we want everyone to follow the rules, right? So as long as that's happening and those those rules are very clear, then then hopefully we wouldn't have a problem. Good. Yeah, and I think that, you know, if you're a, if a restaurant, there's a lot of nervousness in that, right, to make sure you are protected because you become almost a sitting target. And so we, we you know, that's coming up a lot, but it's good to hear. And I think we'll keep talking about that with the different, you know, associations in Austin and different leadership just to make sure that we, and I think Eddie's right, you know, the idea of, and this will go into this question, which is, do you think that every employee and customer should have their temperature take, taken as they come into a restaurant, an office, is that something you would support? We know the EEOC just ruled that it's acceptable to take an employee's temperature as they come to work. Um, that's an interesting concept because there's equipment that gets involved in that. There, we know that just from the CDC guidelines that a fever is one of the many characteristics someone could have. So we've recommended actually part of a wellness program, which is also protected, just a yes, no health survey, you know, to go through every time that an employee comes in. But there are some states that are looking at temperature checking even their guests. Um, would love to know your thoughts on that. Well, yeah, if I may, Tan, it's a, I don't know about, uh, you know, temperature uh, testing guests. I think that that kind of messes, messes with your restaurant experience, I think, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> uh, but certainly it makes sense for the employees to be checked, monitored, if we come up with a standard at the state level on how that might might look. Um, I think that's, that's fair. It's just part of doing business that want to make sure everyone's well. And I think there's some, at the same time, there's some responsibility uh, that, that we all, that we have too, as, as the, the worker has a responsibility to say, well, I'm not feeling well today. I'm not going to come in. And then hopefully we have to also talk about, well, the reason why they might want to come in is because they don't want to lose their paycheck for that day. So we, we do need to re revisit. Mm -hmm. We want people to be safe and not spread, a, you know, if they're contagious in any way, shape or form, COVID or whatever it might be. Um, we should be encouraging people that are sick from not going to work to maybe infect other people. And that's, that's I know a different conversation, a different branch of this conversation in terms of, uh, you know, sick leave and all that kind of stuff. I'm not trying to, to go there, but I'm saying this is a holistic uh, kind Absolutely. of approach. You have to look at it. Um, I mean, the, someone's going to go to work if they need the money and if they're, even if they're sick, and that's just the, that's a fact of life. I mean, I've done, I did that plenty when I was in college and probably not sitting in going <laughs> to school. I mean, going to work rather. Uh, but I did because I needed the paycheck. So, uh, and I think a lot of people in that s same situation. So I think, you know, if we're looking at it holistically, we also look at, if, you know, you know the, the testing for uh, the employees, rather the temperature the testing, mm -hmm. probably not for the guests. I mean, I, that would be a little weird. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then we have to also look at how we can make sure that our, that the employees feel that they can take that sick day without really hurting mm -hmm. the pocketbook too much. 
Well, and I think too, that's where the Families First Act comes in right now, right? So under the Families First Act, we do have paid sick leave, we have family medical leave, right? For those that are suffering from either, I mean, our schools are now closed, right? Till the fall. So we have a lot of families struggling with just trying to go back to work and they have children at home. And so I know a lot of protections were put in place for employees with, um, and we, I think did a really good job as an association trying to get our businesses to understand what's now required. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. We need to have, especially an event like this, which is so, it, we were led to believe, right, contagious and in every form or fashion, if someone does have that or has been exposed, they do have that opportunity to your point, Eddie. And I think that's something we, you know, that other conversation I know we will have as we come back and um, post this, but right now it does. And we need to keep reminding restaurants that do have that, um, any business, right? Not just restaurants, but any business that that is an option for employees. And we don't lose sight with the PPP and everything else that came after it, that that was still something that was passed early that is a real benefit. I just want to come back to the broader question for a moment uh, that you asked, Emily, and that is, you know, look, let's allow the governor and the strike force now to do their work with regard to how they're going to implement things. I concur with Eddie. I think it's it's very reasonable for a, a restaurant to make certain that it has a responsibility to test its people, its employees, and make sure that they're in, in, in good health uh, from a sanitary perspective. Obviously, our restaurants are experts in food safety and sanitary policy so they i mean they're, they're the kings of that so they know what needs to be done and i think they'll put in place and recommend good protocols that that keep us all safe and protected in that regard i also uh you know absolutely concur that we've got to have a communication and education campaign to employees in every industry but particularly those that are going to be in food service and hospitality as the economy gets up and running again that they've got to recognize uh, the importance of staying home if they're sick. And, and so as a result of that, again, that's another burden, candidly, that the restaurant will bear. The, the, the restaurant needs to communicate adequately that don't worry about the fact that you're gonna miss a day or two or a week of a shift. If you are sick, you are sick, you need to stay home and we will cover you. So again, unfortunately, that's another burden, if you will, for the restaurant owners and the operating p &L, if you will, for these restaurants. But it's a reality right now that we have to make certain in order to restore and maintain public confidence. You know, restoring public confidence in all that we do will be the very most important thing in this whole process of this rollout. If the, if the American people and the people of Texas are not comfortable when they go into that restaurant for the very first time, or they hear from their family or their friends that they had a, an experience that was startling to them or concerning to them, in any way with regard to social distancing, with regard to safety, uh, you know, in terms of the way things are being handled, well, it will have a horrific, I fear, uh, repercussion for the entire restaurant sector in Texas and for all businesses we're trying to open it up. So I want everyone to think about how we are responsible for uh, what we do, responsible for our own actions and how we can work together collectively uh, to be considerate of everyone and this fragile ecosystem that we're working to get off the ground again as we as we start this race, so to speak, and get the engines running again of our economy. Again, none of us can wait for that day to happen. Uh, we know the pain and the suffering that's taking place, but we've got to do it intelligently. And when we do it, we gotta make certain that these protocols are being followed. And I just wanna give a shout out, Emily, to you and your organization, because the guidelines and protocols that TRA has already put out there and some of this nice looking uh, materials, little marketing pieces, that talk about this reciprocal relationship. What can society do as a whole to help our restaurants? And, and, and the pledge from society to the restaurants, just like in the inverse, the pledge that the restaurant makes to society to be able to maintain safety and quality and, and all that during this difficult time. So again, I think that's the most essential thing is having consumers be comfortable and confident that they're having a great meal, a wonderful experience, and that safety has been maintained to the highest degree in every aspect of the experience. Yeah, and I'll make a comment on that because I think um, someone had written up about the NRA and um, um, lots of different organizations. So what we did was we assembled that, I call it task force. And what was amazing when you're on Zoom is you can actually see direct competitors looking at each other and we're all talking about the same issue. How do we keep people safe? So just like tonight, right? Politics doesn't matter. Competitors don't matter. It's really about just restaurants and we're all behind restaurants. Um, we actually took all the work it's we did. Texas. It's, about, it's, it's about Texas, right? It's about yeah. Texas, it's about America and all of us coming together to help this incredibly important. 
different sector, right? Help yep, our absolutely. And it doesn't, and that's what I've loved, right? I think the unity that you've seen this, and you mentioned it too, is as much as we're hurting, restaurants are the ones that are still stepping up, right? And feeding others and taking care of others. Oh, but we actually took day, all the health. Every day we're volunteering. Yeah. And so we took the health information and the um, Serve Safe, which is the leader of all the food training in the nation. Um, and we actually took all their data as well and really put together for the governor, um, just to answer the one question I saw come up, this very comprehensive plan, which was this is how we think we should deal with these things. Here's the science behind it. Here's the health behind it. So we delivered the strike force and um, the governor's office, a very comprehensive package that our new head of government affairs helped put together. Um, I'm really proud of it. And I, I think it's, it's we're so far ahead of other industries right now and other states are really looking at Texas and they should as the leader. Um, and I think it's, it, you, you made a very good point. We have to follow this. And I know in tonight's message, to the members, I actually made an effort on some guidance from, from Kelsey was just everyone breathe because there is now this very growth. You can feel it. I know you both can feel it, but people want to get out of their houses and you feel this people, some people are breaking the rules and we have some instances of restaurants opening early. And I just think that's dangerous because I'm watching very closely what's going on in Georgia in particular, believe it or not, also what's going on in Alaska. Would you think Alaska? Well, yeah, they do have restaurants and they had almost no warning to open. Um, and they don't even have equipment yeah. or food, right? It's crazy. So I think, you know, I think that, you know, how you can help us is sort of, we know that the day is coming, but we have to do this right. And if we don't, we're going to screw it up. And it's not that the government is against anybody. It's just that we have been locked in, closed down. And the minute those doors go open, we don't know what's going to happen. So doing it in a very controlled way, I think, really matters, especially as I think about Eddie with so many small restaurants in Austin. And they, I mean, your area has really been hit hard, right? We've seen uh, so many of the closures. We've seen independents have come from you. Magnolia, South by Southwest, or North by Northwest Brewery, Veracruz Taco. This is just in the last week. Yeah. And so, you know, I kind of would love your thoughts of how, how are you going to help? What's going to be your message? Let's say Monday when they, the governor comes on and says, next Monday, restaurants are open. Here are the guidelines. Go. You know, <laughs> we're already taking a breath because we know it's going to be just <laughs> yeah. wild. Well, I guess it would obviously depend on what the guidelines are and everything else and how I would, you know, convey that message to, uh, to these restaurants. But uh, probably the first thing I do is, is uh, let everyone know in my social network that, hey this is they're open for business kind of officially or whatever capacity that is and um and just try to to push as much as i can to these local restaurants um uh, to, to for people to to spend their hard-earned earned money at these places right now how it's if you really the message i would say if you really like this restaurant and you love this restaurant it's part of your community if you want it to survive then you're gonna have to spend some money hard-earned money and, and go out there and and uh, and give them your business uh, otherwise, right. if there's a chance that they don't, they won't be there anymore. Um, here in Austin, as we were talking about this before, before uh, we went live, is Thread Gills, which was a, you know, it's an icon iconic restaurant in in Austin, is no more. And uh, and there's and there's others that are uh, that that are closing down as well, and and some of the uh, city favorites that may not be be back because we know that even even what, whatever the governor decides to do, whenever he decides to do it, it's still not going to happen overnight. You're not going to have people filling up the, mm -hmm. the, the restaurant spaces, the, the dining rooms um, overnight. It's just not going to happen. People are going to, they're going to, people are going to want to ease in. I think, you know, depending on how the restaurants open, I think many restaurants will be, or most of, if not all, will be really responsible in, in testing their, their workers in, ter in terms of temperature, at least. And, and I'm sure that would be a very important thing, I think, for the restaurants to convey that to the public, that this is our this is what we're doing to make sure that you're you're safe. That's right. Uh, and then, um, but it's going to take a little while before some of these smaller local restaurants can get that same, you know, hour long wait before they and people are willing to wait for an hour to, to get a table, right? Um, and so they long for to, those days for sure. Yeah, they do. Uh, so they're going to have to ramp up. So um, you know, I would just encourage them to to uh, to open and to do all the things that they need to do. Uh, to keep their employees safe and therefore keeping all of us safe. And then I would just, just push the hell out of it, you know, on my social uh, network and try to get people to go to these restaurants again and at whatever level they can. Um, and then hopefully yeah. they can hire their employees back slowly and get them back to work because uh, most people would rather work than not if they can't. Absolutely. Yeah, no, you've been such, Probably your social true. following is massive. And I think you've been such a champion and, and they feel it, right? You're, 
restaurants talk a lot about how much support you've given them. And I think it means everything because many of them don't, I mean, people have to remember when we let everyone go, most of the social media folks were let go too, right? So the marketing folks were let go, the social yep. media folks, and it's going to take a lot for them to get back. And we've got even some of our own members that are stepping up to provide free services, right? To get your Google back up, to get your, there's all those things. And, and I, you know, I think what people forget is, and I think Eddie, you said, it, we're an ecosystem. Yeah, so yeah. we've got, you know, window washers and hood cleaners and food producers and distributors and accountants. And I don't think people really knew when this hit that yes, the employees inside the restaurant are gone, but what we don't talk enough about are all the services that rely on restaurants yeah, and they're closed now too. Yeah, there's a supply chain in the restaurant industry for sure that are being the smaller, especially the smaller the restaurant, you know, they, that it impacts the urban farm, the small farm that some that would provide some of the produce for for these smaller local restaurants. I mean, they're 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 hitting it pretty tough times too. You know? Absolutely, Tian. Yeah. Uh, what you know, no, I, I, I want to. Oh, go ahead. Well, I, I was just going to say, obviously, I think Eddie's comments were right on the money, and and uh, you know, look, I. I think it's important for everybody to out there listening that's not in the restaurant business that's listening to tonight's conversation to get out there and support these restaurants today, tonight. I mean, don't wait for them to open up, which is, of course, we know very, very soon now, but make sure you're utilizing them right now for, for takeout and, and, and curbside to go. I mean, every dollar counts for these businesses. And so, you know, I, I, we're all going to promote it as best we possibly can to get out there to show that we're comfortable being in the restaurants and into all of our businesses when they get open uh, so that we encourage other consumers, our fellow constituents and citizens to come out and, and partake uh, again in the life that we've been so blessed to enjoy all these years and we'll get back to. And I think, you know, I, I think it's important for all the restaurant managers and owners on the line to know tonight that you know, this is not going to be something that we are going to immediately get over, right? I mean, Eddie commented a moment ago, it's not going to be a V-shaped, if you will, recovery. We're not going to go straight back up to where we were uh, in January and February overnight. It's going to mm -hmm. take time. It's going to be a very challenging, the next six months going to be very challenging. The next year is going to be very challenging and probably up to a year and a half uh, until we, we get some stabilization around uh, a vaccine, obviously, to address COVID or new medical breakthroughs that can maybe dramatically speed up or alter that curve. We've got to just build confidence and consumer support for what we're doing. So public service announcements, all the social media that we can do as legislators to talk about what's going on, to promote the protocols that TRA is talking about. And I think for individual restaurants to, to find their own angle on the protocols, but, you know, following obviously all the guidelines from the state and federal and TRA, but to put their own spin uniquely on what they're doing to take care of their own consumers and their own, cons their own county, their own city, I think is also very important for them when they think about how they market themselves going forward, right? Because everybody wants to know about safety and security and that when they take their family out, it's gonna be a wonderful experience. Um, so we yeah. just gotta be really smart about that rollout, but certainly myself and all of our colleagues in the legislature will promote all of our restaurants and we'll do it very aggressively to take care of everybody in the state. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things that comes up a lot, there are two areas, right? We initially went to Comptroller Hager, and I'm going to move to taxes now, because I think this is a really significant part yep. for us. Um, and, and you know, listen, he's in a box, too, and, and he's really been a great partner and been very clear with me about what he can and can't do, even from his own seat. Um, but as we look down the line, what, what they have been doing is if restaurants file their taxes each month, and we're about, to, I think, to hit the April here, um, you can make a call pay a partial payment and then have a number of months to pay the rest, right? Which is, which is a, good, a good solution. It's not a great solution, but honestly, it's a good solution looking at where we are in Texas right now um, economically. Um, you know, I think our restaurants, as we rely on them to, to reopen, to rehire, to retrain, to get equipment, to buy new supplies, to get face coverings if we're required, all of that, you're gonna talk about just driving restaurants margin to zero, right? At that point, it may just not even be worth them reopening. So where can the state come in to provide relief when really directly the government mandated our closure, right? So we didn't have an ability to generate revenue out of a majority of maybe 80 or 90% of what we could do. Um, do you see any tax relief for restaurants? I guess that's the first half of the question. In the second half, the great concern is around rent and in and, and some states and whether it has teeth or not is a good question, but you know, protection from being evicted. Um, and I know there's a long line, right? You have to pay your rent and that landlord has to pay their bill. I appreciate all that, but looking at a restaurant today, 
that could have to vacate that space because they need a couple of months to get their feet under them. What kind of protection could you imagine putting in place? So I think there's, those are kind of more meaty things I think that we as a state can do for the, for the sector. What, are, you know, taxes and sort of eviction protection, where do you both fall on that? I don't know who wants to start. Who do you, who do you want to go first? Uh, we'll, let can, Tan, we'll let Tan go first. Tan has that's two a, flags, so Tan gets to go first. He's got flags on there. That's a, that's <laughs> disregard, a, that, disregard that, brother. Disregard that. <laughs> Listen, so I, I think, first of all, with regard to tax policy and what we can do there, look, let me, let me say this. We're obviously in unprecedented waters that we are currently navigating. We know we've got an enormous hit to our sales tax collection that's occurred, obviously, in March and in April. We've got uh, unprecedented challenges in the history of the state and the nation with regard to where we are with the oil sector. So we have all kinds of things that are coming at us. What I will tell you is, is that, you know, there's nothing that we're going to say no to at this point. We're going to be very uh, open and we want to listen and we're going to be creative. We're going to try to find and look for ways working with our comptroller, uh, working with the governor, working with obviously members of the Senate, members of the House, to find ways that we can be creative to be able to help address the pain that all of these businesses, restaurant sector and otherwise, uh, are going to be feeling. And, and so I was very pleased with the flexibility, Emily, that you talked about a few minutes ago that mm -hmm. the Comptroller's Office did provide. Uh, and that a big part of that is communicating, right? When a restaurant is having difficulty, please communicate. Uh, communicate to your local elected officials, communicate to your, your lawmakers, communicate to TRA. Let everybody know what you're going through so we can talk through it. But, but I'll just simply tell you that, you know, when it comes to tax incentives, tax policy, and so forth, as it pertains to trying to provide incentive and help, I'm just saying nothing is off the table. We will look at everything here. It's too early to determine what we can do or not do at this point, but, but we're open and we're listening. That's the first thing I would say there. With regard to the topic around evictions, uh, with regard to foreclosure, with regard to repossession of equipment. These are issues that, uh, that we're all very concerned with. I've been having these conversations with uh, mm -hmm. the governor's team uh, on these issues. I know many of us have uh, over the course of the last four or five weeks, because you talked about it earlier at the beginning of the call. The PPP money, the EDIL money, these things that are coming from the federal government, we're very thankful for them, but they're not flowing in many cases fast enough. And, and we recognize that. So how do we address that? So you know, my message is to all the banks, to all the consumer finance companies out there, again, as you said, Emily, we understand the connected ecosystem that they have to live within. But my hope is that every bank and consumer finance company will work with their local restaurants and give them every benefit to uh, extend the life, to extend an opportunity for them to be survival, to have survival and to make it through this time and to work in a collaborative way when they work through these challenges. Because no one wins. If we're shutting down restaurants due to foreclosure, let me tell you, that landlord is not going to be happy about it. That landlord or shareholder is not going to be happy about it. All those employees are not happy about it. The taxpayer in Texas is not happy about it. It's all interconnected. And so, again, my hope and my prayer is that the banks and the consumer finance companies, uh, when it comes to repossession, when it comes to eviction and so forth, that they will work with these folks, give them every opportunity to be successful, and pull through this storm together. Because at the end of the day, uh, it, that is the best way to protect Texas, to protect our way of life, our economy as a whole, and to be respectful to the taxpayer. And at the mm -hmm. same time, take care of our entrepreneurs and all these folks that are on the front lines. So we just have got to work together and, and be intelligent about what we do. And, and certainly from a legislative perspective, you know, I want restaurants to reach out to me. Restaurants in my district, all the members want to hear about uh, the challenges that they're dealing with. Eddie's talked about that with the restaurant challenges in Austin, please tell us what you're dealing with so we can help be an advocate on your behalf uh, with regard to all of these Excellent. issues. Again, at this point, there's nothing that's off limits. Uh, we're open to all of these scenarios and uh, we are literally working, with, even though we're not in session, around the clock to address these challenges and to find solutions and common ground. Right. Good, thank Eddie. Uh, thank you, Tan. Yeah, and yeah. Tan, you brought up a lot of great, great points there. Um, so I echo a lot of what Tam was saying. Uh, I do think when you have a situation where you have mandated closures like that, that there is a responsibility that the government at some level has to take on some of that because it's there, the reason why the, the man, it's mandated is, is for the public health, right? And that's the, right. that's the jurisdiction of state and federal and local government, frankly. 
but I think in that case, my gut tells me it should be something that's a federal action. The, the federal government tends to be the government that has the ability to, to pay for some of that, um, more so than the state, although I think the state certainly can play a role. We know we have other taxes that restaurants pay, TABC taxes, other Correct. taxes like that. So Next I think, beverage, yeah. Yeah, and I think TABC has done pretty well, actually, on, on trying to uh, postpone some of those tax payments. I think they've done the best they can. So I think we need to you know, look at it kind of as the big picture of all the taxes that, that, the, uh, these, that the restaurants uh, have to pay. And we cannot forget about local property taxes, right? School Oof. taxes, uh, you know, your property taxes. I mean, that's the yep. biggest chunk for the most part. If you, I mean, if you own it, but I mean, that's what, that's what you know, the landlord, if you're, if you're, if you don't own the building, the landlord's paying, that's your rent is paying for his or her property taxes, right? Basically, right. and then some. Um, so I think we have to look at the property tax issue too. How can we, and that will take legislative action, right? That, that, that in situations like this, where it's a, an act of God, for lack of a better way of saying it, um, that there is a way or a mechanism for uh, taxes either to be frozen, but then, you know, at the local level, but then we yep. have to, as a state, make them whole, make those government right. and those entities whole somehow. So that's a, that's a very expensive proposition. But if you really want to talk about saving businesses, you got to look at the property taxes. That's a big, big part of yep. that. And as far we as rent, and as far as rent control and all that, uh, or evictions and foreclosures and whatnot, that is a really complicated issue. I mean, and, and, you know, it's it's complicated because, um, you know, the the bank still might they, they want their payment, and you, you know you can't have the you know the landlord losing the property or whatever. I get that, but. Um, we still have to look at that. We, you know, if we want to save the save the businesses, we have to look at um, different ways that you can extend leases where you can, you can pay it out over time. Give make right. sure those, those options are spelled out for the landlord and make it so. And some of this is federal action where you look at the at banking and how they would have to they can forego rent for a certain period of time without foreclosure. There has to be some kind of guarantee. And I think for for banks, that probably has to happen at the federal level. Tam, you you would know better than, than I on that. But no, Eddie's Eddie's right. I, I agree, Eddie. I mean, I, that's the ideal. In fact, I've had some conversations with uh, some of the leadership in Treasury about these topics around how you address uh, broad on a broad based uh, situation foreclosure, repossession, all these issues. Um, and and that's exactly right. I think it is most elegant for the federal government to act in those areas 100%. Uh, and of course, then for the states to, to then follow the lead. So uh, we've been we've been asking Washington to to look at those issues. I know they are grappling with them now, mm -hmm. looking very seriously as we work to open up the country again. Um, and I and I know they're being taken very seriously at the highest levels. All of these issues. So you know, and again, talking about tax policy and what we can do there. You know, I can't say enough. I talked about 4A and 4B money and things we're working on in that regard. Local entities, those local economic development corporations have a tremendous ability to be creative if we're able to fix some of this bureaucratic paperwork in Austin we're working on now. Yep. That would enable yep. them to be able to step up and help some of these local restaurant businesses. Uh, because again, we mm -hmm. all have to get involved in this solution. Mm -hmm. There's no silver bullet to fix this problem. It's too widespread. And so I want everybody to know that we are partners in this process, but government alone can't save them. They've been incredibly successful historically as operators. It's their excellence. It's the quality of the product, the passion that they bring to the table every day when they serve their customers and take care of their employees. Just as they found successful business models to be successful prior to COVID, they're going to have to adapt and do the same thing. And we're here as a partner to support them. And we will do everything in our power to do that. And, and certainly there's nothing more powerful we can do than promoting the marketing of our restaurants from day one. When our restaurants are safe to go back to and the governor gives us the green light here again, we hope very, very soon we, it's important that we're there and we are uh, going to those restaurants on a regular basis and using them. Um, because the worst thing is for a restaurant to open up and have additional employee headcount expense, uh, right, and no labor, customers. labor expense, the food expense, the utility expense, and not have enough business to support it. Um, so and Tian, do you think, do you think, I mean, a lot of things we talked about may require a special session. Um, do you see a special session occurring before next spring? Emily, that's really all in the purview of the governor. I mean, the governor has the, the greatest understanding of those dynamics in terms of where we are to call a special or not. Um, and, and I think, you know, he'll be very responsive to what, what the developments are on the ground, right? As we go through this cycle, yeah. if he feels it's appropriate or not. Okay, good. So let me, um, I am gonna touch on business interruption because I think it's a critical issue 
Um, Anna, can I have like just one question left? Just letting you okay. know. Okay, and, and I know because it's an important one, and Tan, I know we've actually had some discussions with the federal team on this as well. Um, so we've already seen that whether you had virus coverage or not, your policy could look one of 100 ways, it was denied, right? And, um, and that's been really hard because we have a lot of restaurants. I have one restaurant owner that call, they pay almost 600,000 a year in business interruption insurance, and we're told that this doesn't qualify, right? None of it, the food spoilage to the virus event doesn't qualify, and they actually have a rider for, for virus, right? So, so that sort of what catalyst brought sort of what I call the famous chefs forward and some, some lawsuits forward. And there's sort of two tracks, I think. There's the sue your insurance company, um, and we've told everyone in Texas under the Department of Insurance's recommendation that if you have been denied, file that denial with the Texas Department of Insurance so they have record of it. Um, but you could go down and do a lawsuit. And I don't know if that money will be seen in my lifetime. That's just my experience with looking at Katrina or Sandy or BP or anything. Then there's this idea, something I think you've also kind of thought through with me a little bit is, is there a, a way to have business interruption insurance in the next round of federal funding, right? Is there some way to make these businesses whole because as Eddie pointed to, you know, I, I'll say this as sort of a article five and takings, right? But we were closed. We couldn't generate revenue. Um, we use the insurance we paid in, whether or not you can change a word or two and tell people they're denied. And this is such a serious issue. You can even hear the president in a couple of his remarks talk about business interruption related to restaurants. Um, where do you see the state's engagement in this? Um, you know, does the state have a role? Does the governor have a role to play? In, in thinking about business interruption insurance and sort of what's happening. Because I can tell you right now, there isn't a restaurant or business I have found in Texas that has been awarded their business interruption insurance. And we've got probably hundreds of thousands of businesses now that have filed. So I just love your comments you want, on this one. You want Eddie to go or first or you want me Mark to go? go Tan. You go ahead and go, Tan. Okay. Um, well, look, I mean, th this is again, another critically important element uh, piece of the puzzle. And Emily, you and I have been working on a concept that came from one of our, your, our fellow restaurateurs uh, mm -hmm. in Texas around business Very continuity smart. insurance, a, a brilliant gentleman that had a great idea. And, and we've been sharing that concept with Treasury. I've been sharing it with members of Congress uh, uh, in the House and the Senate. Uh, and, and it's in along with NFIB, right? NFIB is very supportive of this kind of concept uh, at, at the state level and also at the federal level. And so my view is that we need Washington to lead on the issue uh, first. That, that's my view is that I hope that we'll see in some of these relief packages, uh, you know, today, of course, the additional money for the PPP program uh, was allocated and passed by the House. Now it's gone to the president. Um, and But there'll be additional things that we need to do. It's not just about the money, so to speak, in terms of direct relief. It's about these intelligent policy decisions we got to take on in Washington, right? Like we talked about earlier with regard to how we address foreclosure and eviction uh, issues at a, at, you know, repossession at a national level right now. The same thing really applies to business continuity insurance. So I, I think we need to see Washington lead on that. I'm confident that they will uh, lead on that issue at the federal level. Uh, and then from there, then I think Governor Abbott, uh, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, the Senate and the House, uh, we will aggressively approach this topic uh, appropriately. And so I, I love your comments about having restaurant tours that are having this experience, disappointed with the claim uh, that they have submitted, make sure that all that information is documented and the paperwork is there for it to get to TDI. Mm -hmm. uh, just yeah. like the Texas Workforce is a tremendous partner in this, in this yeah, TDI has been great. recovery process, TDI will be, again, another very important partner in this healing and recovery process for Texas. So uh, I think you gave everybody great guidance in that regard uh, as well. So those are my thoughts. Let's see Washington lead, and, and I think Texas will follow accordingly and pick up the pieces as we need to. Um, again, you know, look, the governor and the lieutenant governor uh, are, are passionate about reopening our economy as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, we just have got to do it. They're focused on doing it with data and science and doing it in a way that is safe and in a way that is sustainable for all of our collective good, right? It does no good for us to open up for 30 days and then have an, a, a, a horrible oh. groundswell of this occurring mm -hmm. and our businesses not getting the volume that they need of, of customer support because they didn't have confidence as consumers in our restaurants, that would be a horrible, horrible thing to occur. Yeah. But we want to do Agreed. everything we can to mitigate that and have a very sound plan that is executed with precision and professionalism in every way. 
Well, the business, the business continuity issue, I agree with Tam. You can't do that piecemeal. It really has to be a federal, addressed at a federal level. So it's, it's, it's uh, uniform throughout the country. Um, so I don't have much to add other than there's nothing more frustrating than paying for help for some kind of any kind of insurance oh. and then not getting what Absolutely. you're paying for. I mean, and then, and then you get a letter saying a fungi is different from a bacteria, which is different from a virus. I'm like, yeah. well, I'm not a scientist, but I thought I was buying a oh, policy okay. if my business got interrupted. So, you know, and I think I'll share this with everyone listening. Like this is a huge thing on my, like I'm, this is a big deal for me. So whether it's federal and state for some reason, and I tan knows we've got a gentleman that's part of our industry actually that came up with, I think a brilliant concept today. It went to the stage of um, being with two senators, U S senators that the language is now drafted. And so I do think there's going to be some legislation coming forward federally for this next round. Um, I'm excited about it. I think it will help our restaurants incredibly because they were kind of the forefront of some of the thinking. Um, so everyone who's concerned about it, we can't fix it tomorrow. We can't make your insurance companies pay. Um, everything I've read or everything I've learned, if we just simply try to make a, a force them to or take legal action, you won't see the money while you're still operating. So let's try to go about this in a way that will really give you the money and quickly as you can get it. And so I appreciate your patience. And I think, as Eddie said, it's super complex and it does impact the entire nation. And actually, just for a data point today, they estimate three trillion in losses on business interruption globally for insurance companies, because we have to remember this is not just a U.S. issue That's right. or a state issue. This is Absolutely. a global issue. So we are a very small dot, but I can tell you our voice in Texas is being is being heard. So I'm yeah. going to look go to Anna because she keeps flagging, and then I'm going to get in trouble <laughs> if I don't stop talking. No, I think I think that was a good discussion, and and something we're very focused on. I I think if I can add one thing, it's important for everybody listening to know that this concept that is now before the members of the Senate and the House that we've been able to talk to about it, it's also with folks in Treasury, uh, all came from the idea of one Texas entrepreneur, one Texas restaurant owner. And so let everybody on, the, on this uh, you know, Zoom call tonight realize that your voice is important. We wanna hear from you. When you have ideas and concepts that could be beneficial to all the restaurants in Texas, please let us know. We wanna hear from you so that we can have the chance to be your advocates at the state level, obviously at the federal level as well with our colleagues in Washington. So um, I'll, I'll conclude it with that. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I want to thank all three of you for having this wonderful conversation. There's also been a back channel conversation going on on the side in the chat window and the Q&A window as well. So many thanks to all the people who attended, Vicki Cisneros, David Shaw, um, Jack Gilmore, Brian Stubbs, all you guys provided some really great commentary going on through this as well. So thank you for being interested and involved, obviously, in how to protect your business going forward. We actually answered all of the questions that we had on the Q&A window and in the chat. Um, a lot of it was just commentary. So we can probably wrap up, Emily, with your final thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I'm just going to say thanks again to both of you because, um, you know, there's nothing like sitting in this seat when we're collecting all the data and we're watching this sort of industry spiral down and to know and even tonight to just reinforce your commitment to us and knowing that we'll come to a session next spring. But before that, we, we have you by our side and, you know, you mean a lot to your to your districts and um, and your support of our sector means a lot. And I think even you being on tonight, I hope sends the message to other representatives across the state to join dialogues like this because they need to hear from you. They know we can't, we can push as much as we want, we can share as much as we want, but you actually taking action means a ton. Um, and we, you would never forget who your friends are in a crisis, right? That's one of the rules of life. So I just really want to thank you both. And you've been tremendous for me to work with. As you know, I stepped into this role in August, never imagined that we'd be in a pandemic. Um, and so I just really want to thank you for your leadership and, and we'll keep going and we'll post this and you won't believe how many people watch it tomorrow. So thank well, you again. Emily, thank, thank, thank you. you for the invitation and the opportunity. And thank you for your leadership. Anna, thank you for your leadership, all you do every day for all of the 50,000 individual restaurants in Texas. Think about that number, 50,000 strong. And that's what we're fighting for tonight. And know that uh, we'll be there to be champions and, and, and to take these issues and make them front and center when we're back in session. And in the interim, between now and then, uh, to do whatever it takes to restore the industry and get everybody back on their feet. And what I heard is you want to hear from us, so buckle up. <laughs> we, want, we want to hear every day. Absolutely. Let us let us hear from you. Please, please, please. Uh, Excellent, Eddie. Well, thank you, Emily and, and Anna. And thank you to the, the restaurant uh, owners who are on. I, I know there's some here from Austin that are that were listening in. So thank them for being on here. And uh, we'll get through this together. And Absolutely. I know me and Tan and the rest of the legislature will work hard to try to, to help out in, in any way we can. And appreciate you having us. 
It's awesome. Thank you both very much. Anna, thank you so much. You're so great at this. Thank you. God bless you guys. Y'all take care. Bless Best everyone. families. Thank good you for all you do, everybody. Okay. Bye.